Before we get into it, a huge shout out to Micro Center for sponsoring today's video. Micro Center is the place where you can get all of your PC parts under one roof, or in my case, if you don't live by one, order online at microcenter.com. For a limited time, Micro Center also wants to offer new customers a free solid state drive. Check the link down in the video description to claim your free 240 gigabyte SSD. New customers only, no purchase necessary, valid in store only, and limit one coupon per customer. And a huge shout out to Micro Center for sending over some of the parts in today's build. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff, and let me introduce you to Heavy Metal. I think it goes without saying that this is by far the most difficult PC build I have ever attempted. The frame of this thing is made with 3 8 inch steel plate. It has a 100% custom water-cooled loop with bent copper tubing, and every single part on this machine was 100% built custom for this build. And that custom aspect includes all of the little nickel and dime things to get this thing finished as well, like the power and reset buttons that double as the power and hard drive activity light, to the custom wiring loom inside of here, to even the lighting. Getting all of this dialed in, boy, I'm glad it's done. I made it my goal about two weeks ago to try and debut this PC at PDX LAN, and I actually made it to the show with the PC intact, even if the PC wasn't quite in running condition yet. While I had the copper tubes bent and polished up, it had been a couple of days since I polished them, and I hadn't yet clear coated them, so by the time we got to PDX LAN, they were already tarnished and green and definitely not looking their best. The wiring loom wasn't quite complete, and I was having leaks out of these two 90 degree fittings here. Even the first time I tried to boot up this system, it didn't want to post. Now, as it turns out, it just needed a BIOS update to the most recent BIOS, but kind of like a reality TV show, every single thing last minute tried to bite us in the butt. So what happened between the last video and today? First and foremost, I took everything apart and then sent the frame off to be media blasted and clear coated in a polyurethane sealant. This will help protect the steel and prevent corrosion. Originally, I had mentioned that I kind of wanted to go for a mirror finish, but I'm glad I didn't end up polishing it to that level. The reason being is I like the little bit of rough edges that this has and a little bit of character that it brings. If this was a mirror finish, I'd have to treat this as a white glove showpiece, not a system that can actually sit on my desk and serve a purpose. Now, the case itself was designed and laser cut by Divi, who happens to be one of my patrons. So huge shout out to you for giving me the inspiration to start building this thing. Now, if you want to build this case for yourself, he's not going to sell one and ship it to you. Rather, he will sell you the CAD files, which you can take to a local machine shop and have them build one for you. I'll be sure to include the link to his website down in the video description if you're interested in embarking on something quite this crazy. But keep in mind, it is just the frame and the beauty panels alone. None of the other hardware or schematics for the water cooling are included, so you're going to be on your own there. I mentioned we debuted the system at PDX LAN, and in fact it was on display at the Be Quiet and Mod My Mods booth, so hopefully you got to see it if you were there. The main reason I wanted to go wasn't actually to show off the system though, it was to check out some other mods and get some inspiration as I'm trying to finish a couple of my own. Some of the standouts for the show include an Xbox One S that was turned into a PC, which you might recall is the exact case mod that I'm working on, but this one went in a completely different direction. Rather than trying to keep everything looking completely stock, he used the upper shell of the Xbox and then replaced the bottom of it with a glass panel to stand the whole thing upright. And while mine is going to be a 100% air-cooled affair, this one was using a custom water loop thanks to AlphaCool server radiators and pump. Probably the most interesting aspect of the system was the use of an eGPU rather than trying to cram a discrete graphics card into the Xbox itself. I wish I'd thought of that. Other systems on display included this absolute unit of a tower featuring a Dominus Maximus motherboard and an Intel Xeon 3175X. You might remember this chip from Computex 2019, where Intel overclocked all 28 cores to 5 gigahertz, hid a cooler under the table on stage, and inferred that this would be a daily drivable system even as the lights were dimming in the auditorium. To say it's an odd and unsupported platform would be putting it mildly, as the Dominus Maximus doesn't even have BIOS updates to allow RGB sync across the DIMM slots, so the RAM sticks are just kind of doing their own thing. But I will say, the color scheme of this system is absolutely dynamite, as are the 18-ish hard drives that are hiding around the back. 
And finally, the case mod that is pulled straight out of my brain and put into a physical construct is the Star Trek mod. This was built on a Be Quiet 802 chassis and has almost every single aspect that I had been secretly planning on for months for my next case mod. Yeah, this system has just about everything, from the warp core shroud over the front of the water cooler to the LCARS panel around back, giving you real-time system stats. Unsurprisingly, this system won best mod at PDX LAN 2022, and I could not agree with that assessment more. Needless to say, I had a lot of fun, but you're here to hear about this. So let's go ahead and start with the build process itself, what parts are inside of it, and what I thought about building the most custom PC I've ever attempted. Let's start off with the heart of this system in the ASUS ROG Strix Z690i motherboard. What an incredibly dense, yet immense pain in my ass this board is to work with. I mean that from a form factor standpoint as far as actually trying to plug things into it. There are so many features on this motherboard, it is absolutely crazy. But keep in mind, even though this is an open frame chassis, there's barely enough room inside for the motherboard and power supply to fit, especially when you start adding things like copper tubing and custom sleeved cabling. Because there are so many components and headers on this motherboard, they actually ran out of room to include an M.2 slot. So instead they had to use a couple of stacked riser boards just above the PCI Express slot. On the upside, you get two M.2 NVMe slots. On the downside, unless you buy them as bare PCBs like this, there's no room to install one with an included heatsink. And since I used a Corsair MP600 NVMe drive that has a giant heatsink on it, I wasn't able to put the beauty plate back onto the motherboard. But overall, the heatsink on the Corsair actually fits the looks of this build, so I'm just gonna chalk that up as a win. Also included on the two M.2 riser boards are the addressable RGB headers for this system, as well as an additional system fan plug. So you can imagine how much fun it was to get that plugged in while installing this whole assembly on the side. What's even worse is the daughter board that controls the front IO as well as the four SATA ports that are on this motherboard. And I say included very lightly because the daughter board plugs in with two USB type C mail headers that are not USB C at all. There's also no retention mechanism for the daughter board. It just kind of sits on top of those two male USB-C plugs. In a normal system, this probably wouldn't be that big of a deal, but in an open chassis where space is at an absolute premium, it was kind of a nightmare to make sure everything got plugged in and plugged in properly. But overall, I really do like this motherboard and its feature set, in spite of the small form factor headaches that come with it. But let's face it, Building small form factor PCs, headaches are kind of part of the game. And considering we're hanging a literal RTX 3090 off the side of it, a lot of that headache is to be forgiven. For the graphics card, I opted to go with the EVGA RTX 3090 XC3. And don't worry, I paid for this graphics card. Not only is this the perfect design for the system as it helps fill out the looks of it overall, but the triple fan design keeps it plenty cool. Also, the only RGB element on this is the logo, which coincides with some other accents built into the system. And now onto the elephant in the room in an otherwise very small case, let's talk about the cooling system. How exactly did I fit a full custom water loop into a system that's this small? Well, simple, I went around it. Obviously, there's no room in a system like this for a traditional pump and reservoir. Luckily, AlphaCool makes the Ice Bar Solo, which is an integrated pump, reservoir, and CPU block all in one very tidy package, and it just so happened to fit inside the system within about a quarter inch of its life. Now, technically, the Ice Bar Solo is not compatible with the LGA 1700 socket used by Z690 motherboards, but Asus to the rescue since the ROG Strix includes mounting patterns for both 11.5x and 1700, meaning our cooler bolted right on. For the radiator, I opted for a middle-of-the-road option with a Corsair 280mm unit. This meant my side panel wouldn't be pushed outside the case too far, and I still get some pretty decent cooling performance out of it. You know what site has some great merch? Not LTT.store. For the fans, Be Quiet sent over their all-new Lightwing 140mm units, and this is about as loud as they ever get. Not that that's surprising to anyone. But what was surprising is even under a 4.9 gigahertz all-core turbo, we managed to keep the CPU down to about 90 degrees Celsius. And seeing as how the 12900K is one spicy boy, 
I'd call that a win. Obviously the part you are all here to see though is the copper tubing. And let me tell you, I'm never gonna do this again. Uh, <laughs> it looks fantastic, but my God, what a headache to make this all work. First off, there's only about two to two and a half feet of copper in this entire run. I went through 16 feet of copper tubing. I don't know if you've priced out copper tubing lately, but it ain't as cheap as PETG is. In fact, let me show you what 16 feet of copper tubing scraps look like. Originally, I was planning on being really aggressive and trying to do this with just two fittings on each end of the pipe and doing a full 180 followed by a 90 degree bend straight up. And well, you can see how well that went. Eventually, after many, many, many attempts, I wound up with the absolute perfect bend. There's no wrinkles, there's no creases, there's nothing wrong with this tube except for the fact that I cut it too short after I made it. Eventually, both time and money caught up with me, and I wound up with a 180 degree bend around the radiator, followed by a 90 degree fitting to take me the rest of the way home. Getting this bend was difficult enough as it is, as no one makes a jig to bend 5 8 inch copper tubing in this tight of a radius. I wound up using a ratcheted bender, a dead blow hammer, and more time than common sense would allow to get this result, but it is definitely not a method that I would recommend. Given the system also doesn't have a reservoir, you can imagine how much fun filling and bleeding all the air out of this was as well. As if bending the tubes wasn't difficult enough already, they also chewed through o-rings when I put them into the fittings. Ultimately, the solution was to source a thicker o-ring with a slightly smaller internal diameter in order to get a watertight fit. Polishing the tubes was also a lot of fun. So much fun, in fact, that I did it three times to get it right. I don't know if you know this, but copper oxidizes literally the second you're done polishing it. So I polished the tubes on Wednesday, and by Friday at PDX land, they had already turned green pretty much like this. And I think you'll agree, the polished tubes look a whole lot better. As soon as we got home, I tore everything down, repolished the copper, and applied a generic glossy clear coat, which proceeded to flake right off. So I removed that clear coat with some Scotch-Brite, repolished the tubes, scotch brighted the tubes again to give the enamel some surface to actually bite onto, and finished it off with a generous helping of an automotive glossy enamel. And I think you'll agree, the result is quite stunning. So overall, am I happy with the way the build turned out? Look at it, it's freaking gorgeous. Of course I'm happy with it. Not only that, but it has pretty much the top end consumer parts you can get in an i9-12900K, 32 gigabytes of DDR5 memory, and an RTX 3090. Now, I know literally today they announced both an RTX 3090 Ti and a 12900KS. So if I wanted that extra 5% of performance, it's just $3,000 away. It's fast, it's quiet, it doubles as an engine stand, and it goes like a bat out of hell. Yeah, I'm pretty happy. And I'm sure some of the comments will ask if there's anything that I would rather do differently if I rebuilt this system again. First and foremost, I would not use copper tubing in this particular system. There are some builds where it looks fantastic and I'm sure it went together just as easy as any other hardline tubing. But given the tight quarters I was working with and the thick walled 5 8 inch tubing that I have, I think PETG would have been the better choice. Secondly, I went with a full set of custom cables from Cable Mod, and honestly, I almost wish that I hadn't. Number one, the stock cables were all braided and fully black, and they didn't look that bad inside of here. Secondly, because I went with a set of colored cables with a little bit of a green accent, and I happened to be using a brand new coolant with a black dye in it, uh, let's just say every mistake is on display from here on out. But yeah, overall, I'm very pleased with the way this thing turned out. Uh, if I ever do rebuild it, you can guarantee I'm gonna be using some PETG, even if I do paint them copper. But for right now, this is gonna live very happily on my desk as my new gaming rig. Overall though, I am pretty darn pleased with it. But what do you guys think of this system? Is there anything that you would do differently? And how much do you think it weighs? Let me know down in the comments below. On your way down there, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. 
Follow me on Twitter at Craft Computing for daily shenanigans like this. And if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do, consider joining the Patreon. Link is also down in the video description. I hope you guys enjoyed this one as much as I did. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, all. Try that again. <laughs> Beer for today is from Lord Hobo Brewing. It is the Doom Sauce Black Double IPA, clocking in at 7.8% from Woburn, Massachusetts. And outside of the hop head Grim Reaper here, which I absolutely love, I am definitely looking forward to this. Kind of a black licorice and dark chocolate vibe. Definitely not quite what I was expecting. Yeah, there's kind of a little earthy hoppy note on top and that very slowly evolves into uh, a rich, deep sweetness. Uh, best thing I can equate it to is black licorice. Um, if you're not a fan of black licorice, I don't know that this is the beer for you. That's not exactly what it tastes like, but it's the closest thing I can come up with.